Hello, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Bernard Coleman, the founder of the Coleman Law Firm. How are you doing today, Bernard? I'm doing amazingly well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Great. So could you tell us a bit about your background and why you decided to start your own law firm? Yes, absolutely. Well, it, it starts back uh, a long time ago. The journey uh, starts with uh, my uh, my in my younger years, uh, my mother uh, was a teenage mom, and I had grandparents who were really stepped in to to really help raise me. And 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 really, my grandmother, who just recently turned ninety six years old, uh, really was a foundational force in my life uh, throughout my life. And you know, one of the things that that she did was she educated me a lot about the challenges that that her and my grandfather and that their family faced um, you know, as they were making it through uh, this, the, the you know, Jim Crow and all the things that, that, that happened um, to, to, to us. And so um, that really gave me a certain consciousness and, and desire to wanting to, to figure out how do I help my community? Right. And so uh, I, Ended up, I thought I wanted to go to the NFL, like like many youngsters who came from where I come from. Uh, and uh, my father played uh, briefly with, for the New England Patriots, so I thought I wanted to follow in his footsteps. Uh, but I happened to be also very studious and uh, ended up graduating valedictorian of my class. Uh, but I also had developed uh, some football talent, and, and I was a running back. And our my senior year uh, gained a lot of attention from the national media. Uh, we were 33rd in the nation, and we went up to the next to the state championship. And different colleges, and universities were recruiting me. Um, among those were Ivy League colleges. And my football coach, you know, he said, "Okay, Bernard, I want you to really focus and look at the Ivy League, which." You know, to me as a kid coming from where I came from, and it was something you saw on television. You saw, you know, in television shows, you saw people with Harvard T-shirts on. And you heard about it. Uh, I had didn't know anyone who had ever gone to an Ivy League school. Again, I come from very, uh, come from very humble beginnings, and so ended up going to Harvard, uh, where I majored in sociology. Uh, and I took that time to really focus on um, every paper uh, research project that I had. I always tried to bring it back to, to, to our community because I wanted to understand what was the difference between the haves and the have nots. And through that study, uh, what's, what really stood out to me was the importance of business ownership. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about business. Again, had no one in my family who, no one uh, I knew who was an entrepreneur. I didn't know the language. So what I did was I would go to the store and I would buy the business magazines, uh, like Inc., Entrepreneur, uh, Success Magazine, uh, and just wanted to learn the language. And so I ended up uh, wanting to become a lawyer. I said, okay, let me look at the law as being a, a powerful tool and a force for the creation of businesses. And when you look at Congress, for example, it's dominated by lawyers. And so I ended up actually choosing the path of, of becoming a lawyer. And I ended up going to the University of Virginia uh, School of Law and had a great experience there. Um, and when I graduated um, in 1996, I ended up going to a, one of the big law firms in Atlanta called Troutman Sanders at that time. It's now Troutman Pepper. And a lot of the firms have merged and changed names since I started with them. But started there in their asset-based lending group. Uh, I thought I wanted to do more M&A, mergers and acquisitions type work. Um, ended up leaving there. I'm saying, man, you know, this big firm stuff is not for me. I need to go to a smaller firm. And so I go to a smaller firm at that time called Mink and Snyder and had a great experience there, uh, did a lot of great deals, a lot of mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance deals. I got a lot of experience and uh, started to be, at that time, this was uh, kind of the late 90s where the economy was booming, technology companies were booming, uh, everyone was getting funded, money was plentiful, and they didn't have enough lawyers to do the work. And so I was able to then transition to another firm. At that time, I had a growing family and kept getting a call from a headhunter who was 
offering me these astronomical uh, salary figures that caught my attention. So I decided to, to at least peek and look and see what's, what's going on with, these, with, the, with, with the other firms and ended up going to a firm where I spent most of my career at Morris Manning and Martin uh, in Atlanta. Um, I was there for almost 10 years. I became a partner there in their, in their uh, corporate and securities practice group. Um, and then from there, I went to a firm called, at that time, Womble uh, Carlisle, is now Womble Bond Dixon, um, where I was a partner in their corporate and securities group, but I also started a sports entertainment practice. I was a, a young attorney, a young partner at that time, and wanted to figure out my own niche. And I had a lot of people that I seemed to know in the sports entertainment arena. Uh, I had a partner who was my mentor. I, I referred to him affectionately as my professional father, who gave me an opportunity. Uh, we coming from very different backgrounds, but we connected. Um, and, and, you know, I played football at Harvard. His grandfather played football at Harvard, for example. He had four kids. I have four kids. And we, we meshed. And so and he looked after me um, at Morris Manning. And, you know, I don't, for those with big law firms can be treacherous in terms of the environment. It's a very doggy dog, cutthroat. Um, environment in terms of everyone trying to to up one up the other and you know my uh, one partner referred to it as a pack of dogs and so coming from where I came from I didn't know anything about that and it was just kind of a, you know really a sheep being led to the slaughter I didn't know I'm just, you know I'm going I was coming to work but I didn't know all the politics and everything that went along with that but during the course of my career just worked with a lot of big law firm a big companies uh, venture capital uh, funds and, and companies that had grown to a place where they were able to sell for 30 million, 50 million, 100 plus million dollars. So I saw this wealth being created and I wanted to figure out how do I bring that back home? And I realized that I needed to leave the kind of the ivory tower, if you will, and, and start my own firm so that I could be more accessible at that time. And this was in 2012. My billable rate was already 500, almost 500 an hour. And so I knew I wouldn't be, I was priced out of the market I really wanted to serve. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to help creators create. And so I started my own firm um, in 2013. And, and that's where the journey began for the Coleman Law Firm. Wow, that's interesting. And you mentioned uh, working on mergers and acquisitions in the tens and I guess millions of tens and basically in the tens of millions of dollars. What's the, um, is that the average deal size that you've worked on and how are you seeing and are, how often are you seeing black entrepreneurs involved in these deals? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of my focus today is in the um, capital raising space. So I do a lot of, a lot of representation of companies that are looking to raise capital. Today, one of the most popular ways of raising capital is using what's called uh, regulation CF, which is a crowd equity crowdfunding exemption. And so companies that are, I represent are raising usually between 150,000 to a million plus uh, using regulation crowdfunding. The maximum is 5 million uh, per year. Um, and then companies that are outside of that that are doing just regulation D offerings, uh, those can range anywhere from 500,000 to, to 2 million. And most of my clients um, are, are, are people of color. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I enjoy uh, working with underrepresented founders and helping them understand the process. Because right. a lot of that is just, you know, information and knowledge that, that a lot of us don't have access to um, and haven't had access to, especially since, you know, a lot of that knowledge and information has historically, it's been really at the large, with large law firms. Right. And so, you know, I wanted to bring that experience to, to, to founders and startup uh, companies. And, and that's really where I focus today. That makes sense. And you served as a legal advisor to venture capitalists um, and other investors also, correct? Yes. And I do today. I still do. As you still do. Okay. And what type of legal advice do you provide to them? What type of legal advice does a, um, does a venture capitalist, for example, need? Well, well, it really starts with the fund formation process. And so, so folks will come to me who are interested in forming investment funds where they're looking to pool money to to invest in other companies or other other funds and so uh, it really starts with the formation process um choosing the the, the right entity form 
uh, creating the structure, doing the, all the legal documentation that it takes, uh, the filings that are that are involved, and then walking them through the process of investing, looking at the terms of those investments, uh, the documentation, and so on. So it, it really covers the gamut from the due diligence, the formation, due diligence, and also actually drafting agreements, the agreements necessary to memorialize investment uh, decisions that they make. Understood. What's the most common piece of advice you um, you've had to offer entrepreneurs? Oh wow, uh, that's a that's a lot of there's a lot of advice uh, there. Um, you know, I think first of all, when 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 an entrepreneur is starting out, you know, you start out with the end in mind, and so you know, when I'm advising clients, I'm always wanting to understand what. What are your ultimate goals and objectives, personally and in business? Because based on those objectives, that will determine what path we should take and how you should move in terms of the development and growth of, of your business. Uh, and a company that's looking to, a founder is looking to establish a lifestyle business where they're just looking to, to, to earn a certain comfortable uh, living and, and generate revenue. They don't anticipate ever selling. They want to pass it on to their kids. That's one model. The other model is I want to raise money from venture capitalists. I want to go public. <laughs> I want to be a, a unicorn. I want to be a billion dollar company. That's a very different uh, structure uh, and framework as far as a, a, your company is concerned. So it really starts there. That's that's one. Um, I think number two, you know, whenever you're dealing with uh, employees or service providers, every employee or service provider should have an agreement that memorializes what that relationship is and that protects the confidential information that you're developing and that they may be developing for you. One of the things that, that a lot of entrepreneurs may not realize is that when you're working with independent contractors, if you don't have an agreement that states that what they're doing is for you and that will belong to you, that intellectual property or whatever they're doing belongs to them. And so it's very important to have an agreement in place that is very clear on the work product and that work product belonging uh, to the company. Um, another one is making sure you understand the difference between who was an employee and who was an independent contractor. Because a lot of times you think that someone is an independent contractor when in fact, they actually under the law qualify as an employee. And the law doesn't care what you call them. So if you mischaracterize someone as an independent contractor, you haven't been paying your payroll taxes, you haven't been complying with employment and labor laws of your particular state and at the federal level, you can get caught with a huge liability because that, let's say things don't, don't work out and that person goes and gets a lawyer, they're gonna, that's one of the first places they're gonna say is, hey, wait, you know, you were actually an employee and you deserve to have minimum wage at least and how much did you work? And, you know, so, and then now you're facing lawsuits from, from an, from past you thought were independent contractors yeah. trying to claim their employees who are coming after you that can really cause a lot of trouble and create a lot of liability uh, for your business. Another is this with ratio your name, your trademark. You know, don't invest a lot of time and money into a brand and a name that you haven't investigated first to see if it's even something that you can trademark and protect or that it even it may infringe on someone else's trademark. And trademark laws are, are somewhat complex in terms of who has priority over what name. But in terms of your, your trademark protection, you always want to ultimately obtain a federal protection that protects you, protects you on the federal level uh, with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And you want to make sure that, before, again, before you start going, that you are not infringing on someone else's trademark. And there are companies where you can, you can actually do conduct searches, for example, to see what else is out there, who else is using uh, the name and how they're using it. Um, and another thing that needs that, you know, entrepreneurs should know that just because you have a word or you're spelling it differently does not make it non-infringing. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the key thing is from a, from a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, perspective is is it confusingly similar? Mm. Is it confusingly similar? Would a reasonable person, would they possibly be confused with whatever the brand name being coming from this source versus you? Yeah. And so that's another area that, that can be very costly um, for entrepreneurs that don't you know, address that um, in the proper way. 
And the last thing, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is never accept money from anyone without talking to your a securities lawyer. Mm -hmm. Anytime, anytime you issue money, you, you receive money from someone who's giving you money as an investor, you are subject to state and federal securities laws. It doesn't matter how small of an amount it is. And whenever you're, whenever you're issuing a security, and, and, the, and the term security can also cover notes, it can cover investment contracts, as well as stocks. A lot of people think of a security just as a, as a stock, yeah. but it, it's a very broad definition under the, secu under the securities laws. And so you really want to be very careful to make sure that you're doing it in the right way. And the basic framework that entrepreneurs should keep in mind is that whenever you're issuing a security, there are two primary elements you need to address. One is you, you need to understand and qualify for an exemption from registration because the unregistered sale of securities is actually illegal, but for you qualifying for an exemption from registration. And that's at the state level and at the federal level. So number one, you got to identify an exemption. And of course, over 99% of companies are, are, are issuing privately. They aren't going public. So they're issuing privately. They must do so in accordance with an exemption. And that exemption has rules that determine how you can offer, who you can offer your securities to, how much you can offer, how much you can raise. And, and so all of that, all those terms you must abide by in order to get the benefit of that exemption. The other thing that investors need or, or issuers need to understand is the, the element of disclosure. You have an obligation to disclose everything that an investor would find material in making his or her investment decision. So you, there's a, that's where the PPM or offering memorandum comes into play. And so you want to have some documentation that discloses not only all, the, all of the reasons why they should invest, but also that covers all the risks associated with investing. And so that's also something very important. And, I, and I'll stop there. Oh, man, you could keep going if you want. Those are all great, great points and great insight. I did want to circle back to the one that you mentioned about um, the employees versus the contractors. What, what is the difference between both in the eyes of the law? Well, the laws vary from state to state, so it, it, it depends on um, what state that employer is in. Okay. But one of the primary things that, that, is, that is looked at is, do you have control over how that person is rendering the services to you? So mm -hmm. if this person is coming to your office, you're providing the computer, you're supervising them and telling them exactly how they need to perform the tasks and work that they have that they need to do for you. It's a good chance that person actually is an employee and not an independent contractor. Okay. So an independent contractor is someone who is totally independent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they're doing work on their own time, using their own equipment. And so, and, and they're delivering services that is in, that they that they control right that is that are being rendered to your company right so that's those are the, some the primary framework again it gets even more complicated in terms of how the law there are different elements that they look at in terms of determining whether that person is an employee or independent contract and independent contract and if you and if you are you're uncertain you should contact an, 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 a labor and employment attorney who can walk you through the process and I'm a corporate and securities attorney. I actually refer labor and employment issues to, to labor and employment attorneys who specialize in that area. It's a specialized area of practice. Understood. Thank you. And switching gears uh, a little bit, I know you have an interest in you know, blockchain, Web3, and innovation. So right now, that space is it kind of seems like the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. um, what related legal issues do you see, I guess, currently? And do you see arising in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, of course, Web3 is, is something that's new and the law has not caught up with it. The laws are very, very slow to change in terms of being, you know, the laws that we're using, for example, from a security standpoint are laws from the 1930s and 1940s. And so you, we're, we're trying to apply a, an, an outdated legal framework 
to new world problems and issues. And so there's a lot of uncertainty in how, how to do that. Mm -hmm. One of the primary issues that, that we see right now is, goes back to the securities aspect of the issuance of your token. If you're a company that's creating um, a cryptocurrency, and you know, right now I think there are over 2,000 or, or more cryptocurrencies that are, that are being created, or maybe 20,000, that people, that companies have created, there's a big question as to, is that token, is that a security or is it a utility token? That is an area right now that's being heavily contested in one of the most important cases of note, which is the case right now between the Securities and Exchange Commission and Ripple, dealing with their token, the um, XRP. Mm -hmm. And so that issue and how that case, however that case is decided, is going to reverberate throughout the industry, is going to affect other issuers as it relates to whether or not the tokens that they're creating for their, for their platform, for their business, whether that actually is, is a security and needs to actually now go through the, the securities legal framework in terms of issuance, or if it's actually a utility token that they can sell and they can collect money from outside of the securities uh, law framework. And the, to give you some additional context for that, we're, they're, we're applying what's called the Howey test in, de in determining whether or not something is a security. Now, the Howey test comes from a case that dealt with orange groves. Let's show you how it, like, it deals with orange groves. So now we're trying to apply the same test wow. elements to digital assets, right? And so the, the, main, the, the, basic, the basic test is, is it an investment um, in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of a return on investment through the efforts of others? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, of course, that's a pretty broad, broad space to, OK, how do you how do you m maneuver through that? But and so it's almost like right now, from an SEC standpoint, whenever someone is doing a token offering, it's almost like they look at it as a securities offering unless you can tell you can prove otherwise. Right. And so one of the key things that that those who are creating or participating in, you know, the, the actual in blockchain, crypto, the Web3, and creating and look, creating you know virtual worlds and tokens and cryptocurrencies in terms of how they how they conduct their operations is if you're selling a token before your platform is actually built, it is very likely that's going to be considered a, a, a security. If your if your if your if your platform is already built and people need to purchase those tokens to participate in the platform. You're not marketing them as, hey, buy this because they're going to be very bad. It's going to be really valuable in the future, right? Then you're more likely to fall at, in the, the bucket of a, a utility token outside of the securities framework. And so, you know, that, again, that's just some, that's a basic uh, idea of kind of when you're approaching your Web3 business and creating tokens, how you need to kind of, mm -hmm. some of the issues you need to think about Right. Uh, in terms of, of no, whether, figuring out whether or not you need to, to get a securities lawyer, uh, and you probably should to help you, you know, navigate through that, com that complex maze of, of regulation, and right. if you're able to fall outside of it. That's Another, there are a lot of intellectual property issues also um, that, are, that are very prevalent as we go into this whole blockchain, virtual world, metaverse uh, scenario. Um, and then a lot of it deals with NFTs, for example, you know, when you have an NFT, that NFT comes with certain rights and whatever the, the, the underlying asset that that NFT represents, usually that's a license. And so in that license to distribute or copy or trans distribute, all of that is governed by the, the, the terms of the license. You need to know what that is before you start doing anything with it. Mm. Um, there's, there's, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, and also if you're a company that's kind of issuing tokens and there's money law and I'm anti-money laundering and regulations you may have to deal with, with FinCEN, um, know, you, kind of know your customer uh, issues. Um, there's gambling issues that can come into sweepstakes issues. If you're, if people can earn tokens, for example, by entering into some type of sweepstakes or, or game of chance, there's, there's a lot of, lot of regulatory uh, coverage based on 
the business that you're in and, and how you're operating that um, in, in terms of participating in uh, the metaverse and Web3. So let me switch gears a little bit again. Okay. So according to some reports, well, a lot of reports actually, somewhere between 30 trillion and $68 trillion will be shifting um, from baby boomers to the Generation X and millennials. They're calling it the great trans, the great wealth transfer, the greatest transfer of wealth that we've seen in our in multiple generations. And part of this wealth includes assets like businesses, right? So how does somebody like myself or many other people who are interested in buying businesses, how do they take advantage of this opportunity? Well, I like to, I'll start here. You know, whenever you're looking to buy a business, it starts with capital, mm. right? You have to have the capital necessary. And when I refer to capital, I'm not just referring to financial capital. Most people just think of, when you say capital, it's about money, but it's also about human capital. It's human capital and financial capital. And the human capital comes first. So whenever you're, you're looking to buy a business, of course, normally you may have to get financing from an outside source. And that outside source is gonna be looking at your experience. Right. Now, in terms of opportunities that may not require that experience, I think it's important for, for millennials and Gen Xers to look at franchising. Franchising, is a different business model that doesn't require you to have experience for you to enter into it. Because by its very nature, it provides a framework that gives you a roadmap and the tools necessary to be successful, mm -hmm. right? So if you're going to buy, uh, for example, a fitness into a fitness franchise and establish a fitness, you don't necessarily have to be a fitness trainer or have any knowledge of it. They're gonna give you the training, they're gonna give you the roadmap, but you do need some acumen as it relates to business operations. And so another way that people can take advantage in terms of, and I go back to that human capital, is learning from the ground up. You know, so for some, so for a lot of, that will be looking at investment banking, for example, as a career. Um, looking at management consulting. There are companies like McKinsey and Company and Bain and Boston Consulting Group that are great training grounds to help you gain the knowledge and information and experience that will prepare you for business ownership. You can, of course, get an MBA. But the human capital, again, is, is everything. Because without the human capital, the financial capital is worthless. When investors are looking at investing in a business, and let's look at the venture capital, uh, venture capitalists who are investing at the highest levels, they'll always tell you that the team is number one. Yeah. Right? They don't care. I mean, the business is cool, it's great, but a, 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 a grade A team will turn a business that's failing in, into a winner. A grade C team can turn a great business and run it into the ground. So I think that human capital is, is extremely important to set the stage for su being successful as a, as a business acquirer, mm -hmm. attracting the financial capital that will be necessary to be successful in that business. And again, franchising, I think, can be a great training ground because it doesn't require you to have a ton of experience in that particular arena. Yeah. And they hold your hand, depending on the franchise, they give you support through the process mm -hmm. because your success is their success. Right. If you're just acquiring a business outside of a franchise model, you're on your own, right? You have to figure it out. Okay. And that's where that experience comes in of you know, being a part of a business that may have been similar, you know, you know, rising up through the ranks and becoming the CEO or COO or C-suite executive in a company so that you understand all that's involved in terms of what makes that company a, a great value and success. Right. 
what trends are you seeing in the M&A space? And I'm wondering that because you mentioned um, franchising. I don't know if that's um, something that's becoming more popular or it's always been popular. What are you seeing out there? Um, I think it's, it's, it's it has always been popular. Um, I think it it's even more popular because of the accessibility of it. Okay. Right. So with a franchise, a lot of the hard, a lot of the foundational work has already been done, right? So you're basically taking a model that has some proven track record of success and executing it. Mm -hmm. And the capital needed to do that can be, depending on the franchise, a lot less than if you were starting from scratch and having to develop and to develop everything from the ground up. So I think the franchising is something I think is not as necessarily as popular maybe in our community as it, as it should be. And I think maybe it's not as popular in terms of right now, everybody kind of thinking of, a lot of people think of, you know, the big, you know, becoming, uni, you know, having unicorns and being like becoming Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. But there's a lot of great franchisees that are doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. And again, that can be a training ground for you now to step out. Right. Because you got to understand a lot of the basic mechanisms of again you know, of a business. You got to need to understand basic economics and financial statements, and understand how to manage employees and how to manage distribution and supply chains and all these different parts of of, of having a successful business um, in franchising. And franchising gives you a, a certain uh, support mechanism in doing that. That if you just acquire a business outside of that on your own, you're just having to figure it out. And this, depending on who you are, where you are, yeah. I think it will it will determine what path makes the most um, sense for you to take. And I guess in some instances, when you're buying a business, there's already like an established team there, and you might yes. just be making it. You know, the owner is like, piece yes. them out, and you just kind of step into his role, and he already has the operations in place, and it's already on autopilot, so to speak. Yes. Yes. And there's a lot of risk that's also can be this inherent in that. And there's a high bar of entry, mm -hmm. right? Because the things that you mentioned in terms of how it's on autopilot, it's profitable, you got a great team in place, it's making money. Who wants to sell that business? Right? I mean, like, I'm right. A lot of people want to, you know, the, the best business. Now, there, there are circumstances where I'm getting ready to retire. There's yeah. been a big life change, you know, something happens. But, you know, a lot of people trying to ride out on up. <laughs> so, but however, and, and, and the value of that, the, the, the less risk, the, the higher the bar to entry, because mm. the more value they can demand for it. Yeah. Right. So, so that's the other part. So if you have access to the millions of dollars that it may take to acquire that business, then great. But if you don't, then we have to think of another direction again, franchising can be, or starting your own business um, mm -hmm. and getting, because again, that financing, again, I talked about the human capital, but the financing, the financing is, is where also, even those who may have great experience, oftentimes the finance, the financing, especially for our community can, can, is, is oftentimes more elusive than it should be. Right. 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 Even for some of the best of us. And, yeah. and so, and, and, and the most accomplished sometimes still have problems finding capital getting access but but today with regulation crowdfunding and crowdfunding i think it's becoming easier and has and is easier today than it ever has been to access the capital markets for everyone for everyone and so talking about accessing capital now what also are you seeing that is i'll say is working but other alternative uh sources of capital what are you seeing out there that more business owners are taking advantage of uh, in addition to the crowdfunding yeah so outside of crowdfunding of course there's your friends and family you know that's always and it's also your personal savings mm -hmm. credit cards some business our businesses get started with credit cards when you're having good credit you're able to leverage your income that you may have say working in corporate and parlay that into the into what you need to actually start your your business um, I think people are able to borrow against 401ks and I think but the one of the primary areas of, of, of sources of capital is equity in, in your home and this is where home this is why home ownership is often so important as a wealth building tool 
right? Because so many businesses are started by pulling the equity out of their homes to start their businesses. Right. So communities that have lower home ownership is just by default, it's gonna have a lot less access to capital to start a business. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on people using life insurance, um, borrowing against life insurance as another source of capital? Oh, I think it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. You know, I don't give financial advice. Sure. And I think you know, people should people should consult with their their financial advisors or your tax their tax advisors. Yeah. Um, but whatever access to whatever capital you can get access to, mm -hmm. get access to yeah. if it makes so. financial and economic sense. Right. And I think you know it's important to make sure you you fully understand the risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where people like you come in. Well. I, I can help. I can help. <laughs> so I can help. No, that's great. Hey, yep. Bernard, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I definitely Yo, thank you stopping by and um, chatting. And absolutely. where can people uh, find you if they're looking for some uh, legal counsel? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they can always contact me on my website, which is uh, tclfirm.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn as, as Bernard Coleman. Um, on LinkedIn, um, they can always call me. Uh, my um, my direct number is 404-964-4835. Uh, they can email me at bcoleman at tclfirm.com. And so those are kind of the primary ways of, of getting in touch with me um, if, if I can be of service. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, and you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much, Tony. No a pleasure. Take care. Okay.